Thank you, thank you, Diego. Thank you, Gianni, for asking me here. Actually, my speech is in part uh, uh, connected to the presentation of the early results of the Innovide, Innovine project, uh, as well as uh, other um, partial results uh, uh, that this project has already uh, provided, uh, but that haven't been finalized uh, yet. Uh, well, some of the results uh, um, come directly, have come directly as uh, brand new acquisitions thanks to the Innovine project. Let me introduce this discussion by presenting a couple of charts which are very meaningful for the wine sector. This is a pretty recent uh, uh, chart that shows uh, the agri-food uh, um, market in Italy. I know if it's um, credible or not, but we seem to have a current deficit in our agri-food trade balance, which is minus 5.7 billion euros. It's hard to believe, but we're importing more than we export, which sounds strange when you talk about Italian agri-food products. But that is explained by the fact that imports are actually very high, but what should keep us very happy is that when you focus, when you drill down to the wine sector, well, wine is one of our uh, key exporters. There has been an ongoing trend in exports of wine with almost 5 billion euros in 2014. And I think we should credit all the people in the audience for this wonderful result. This means that despite a declining consumption, which is around 35 to 36 liters per person per year, which is uh, very little compared to a few decades ago um, when people used to drink up to 200 liters per annum. Um, well, that is a big, big decline. These are the topics that I should uh, deal with. In particular, the first on this list is particularly dear to me. It's the one that combines uh, the Italian viticultural tradition, uh, and it, again, it combines it uh, with uh, innovation. Uh, we needed to make the tradition and innovation uh, come together. Uh, we needed to be able to not relinquish tradition while accepting uh, uh, what comes, uh, what, whatever is useful in what's new, and then that's what Innovine as a project is attempting to do. Again, referring to common sense, common sense tells us that sustainability can be described in a number of ways. However, I think that sustainability is also what you get when you try to attempt to use in the most efficient way the natural resources that you're blessed with. And I think that sunlight is basically the one free of charge resource that we can use in our vineyards. And therefore, all the choices that you make that have been summarized in this slide in a very simple way, going from row spacing to the height of the canopy and thickness of the canopy, have to be optimized in view of that. Using, for instance, uh, spur pruned cordons, like in this case, uh, uh, which uh, has at least uh, uh, three wires on top of the bottom wire with a total uh, espalier uh, height of 1.2 meters, is not something that you do by chance, by slight chance, it's an attempt to, to maximize efficiency in the future vineyard. This is a slide which is somewhat complex uh, that my friend uh, Professor Pagliotti uh, lent to me. It takes a long while to, to load. Well, these are vineyards uh, that uh, are obviously espaliers. You see that uh, the uh, size of the shadow has a different, uh, uh, is different depending on the time of the day. But if you look at this picture, you will probably realize that uh, 
this vineyard is probably not optimized as to its use of sunlight because uh, uh, perhaps the uh, rows are too spaced uh, compared to the height of the canopy. So this uh, um, farmer is uh, wasting sunlight, uh, quality and revenue eventually. And that uh, is something that could uh, be recovered if the plantation of the vineyard had been better designed and calculated. Now, in terms of training methods, you know that vines are known as being a plant, uh, a plant species uh, which is uh, um, the readiest to be um, trained to different geometries. It it's can fit in with a number of different geometries. So, wall shaped uh, uh, training methods uh, such as the espalier. Um, are as if can be as efficient as uh, other training methods where the vegetation uh, can grow freely. Why is this geometry of the canopy becoming more and more relevant today? Well, essentially for two reasons. One is physiological, and that's extremely rigorous, and this is a measurement of net photosynthesis um, versus uh, um, sunlight intensity. This is uh, wire-free training wire free canopy measured uh, before the wire is uh, um, placed in the canopy and then after the training wires uh, have been applied and the photosynthesis will go down by one fourth, one quarter, uh, depending on whether you don't or do use the wires. So evidently, you can have uh, uh, cases where you have the same leaf surface, but the different uh, result in terms of, ama of the amount of photosynthesis, which uh, directly translates into a loss of uh, revenue or a gain in revenue. Now, these uh, um, canopies uh, that grow upwards uh, and freely give these results so this is a Sangiovese that uh, it hasn't got a very satisfactory color. The pinkish uh, hue is not by chance uh, the one that tends to develop uh, in the berries that are most exposed uh, to sunlight. It has been demonstrated uh, that uh, the berries of some red uh, varieties, uh, uh, particularly Sangiovese, uh, when exposed uh, to heat excesses above 35 degrees C, tend to reduce uh, their anthocyanin synthesis as well as an accelerated degradation of existing anthocyanins. So uh, the berries uh, will develop this pinkish color. So it does not come as a surprise uh, that a free canopy like this, uh, here you see a close-up of uh, uh, the uh, berry level, the microclimate of the uh, berries and of the bunches is not one where they are overly exposed, but you have uh, a more diffuse light uh, with uh, some uh, sun rays uh, that get across the canopy and hit the bunches directly. But that is what is being developed increasingly in different uh, viticultural areas around the world. And nowadays, in California, many training methods have been uh, reconverted from the traditional espalier to other methods that will somehow provide partial coverage of the bunches for these very same reasons. And the same uh, can be done for white varieties or for other reasons, other sets of reasons. Now, going back to something that's very dear to me, that is how to um, optimize uh, green uh, pruning. Uh, this is a very old chart uh, that shows data that go back <laughs> to my PhD thesis. Well, you see the net photosynthesis of the vine as a function of the position of the leaf or of the bud. You know that up to flowering, the basal leaves are uh, the ones uh, that do most of synthesis, and then from various on, on it's the apical leaves uh, that provide uh, the most photosynthesis. Now, 
How can we exploit this? The two pointers, the two red pointers uh, uh, that I've placed on this chart uh, that I've added to the chart uh, should show us uh, where we should focus our attention. Based on uh, these two pointers, uh, we've uh, tried to develop uh, green pruning techniques to solve uh, different uh, specific problems. The first is uh, uh, the early defoliation uh, technique, uh, which I'm not going to describe, uh, um, if not to say that in the vast majority of cases, it can provide a very significant results in terms uh, of what you see here. This is uh, Trebbiano Romagnolo. It's a hyper tight bunch which is very prone uh, to rotting. In terms of early uh, defoliation response, it can really give excellent results uh, or ma very meaningful. And the morphology of the bunches changes significantly. It becomes looser. Uh, and it would be very hard to do the same, to achieve the same results using other methodologies. But this is a well-known fact by now, so I won't go into the details. It's something that we take for granted by now. What I would like uh, to uh, show is what we've been doing with Alberto Pagliotti in the past few years, the second aspect. In other words, we know very well that from Verizon on, it's the apical leaves uh, that most contribute to photosynthesis. So then why do this? This is something apparently strange. This is around Verizon time. Defoliation in, on the top um, half of the canopy will bring a specific results. Of course, uh, this is aimed at obtaining a very a specific uh, um, demonstration. In other words, demonstrating that that will lead to a slowdown in uh, uh, ripening whenever uh, a very fast ripening can be a problem in terms of sugar maturity. Now, the, if you remove the most functional leaves uh, in the top portion of the canopy, you will reduce uh, the ability of the, um, of the plant uh, to affect uh, sugar uh, development uh, um, more quickly. Now, here you see the soluble solids. So this is very interesting in itself, but this is also very interesting, the color. The amount of anthocyanins, uh, despite uh, uh, the change uh, um, uh, brought about by this technique, uh, the, the anthocyanins uh, develop to the same extent. Uh, so that's very interesting. We can selectively uh, slow down a sugar accumulation while not affecting anthocyanin development. Uh, that translates in a very simplified way into um, cultivation practices. Uh, mechanically defoliating uh, the portion of the canopy where you don't have any bunches, that, that's you know, very easy to do and you can work very fast, uh, which is not the case. Uh, uh, if you uh, take away the leaves uh, at the bunch level. And that is something documented. Another approach, uh, and I forgot to mention this, whenever you see the symbol of the Indovine project, it means that the data have come evidently from that project. So you see that here there's a different approach uh, that is proving interesting and relevant to us. Again, whenever you need to slow down sugar maturity, which is particularly uh, a, a very deeply felt problem in certain viticultural areas, the other possibility is to use anti-transpiration substances. And this is something uh, that comes natural. Uh, there is a partial stomatic closure, there is a partial reduction of photosynthetic uh, processes. You see what happened in 2013. This was a favorable year in terms of sugar concentration. This is Barbera in the area of Colli Piacentini, 26 uh, bricks degrees in the control. While here we have two treatment cases where vapor gut, that was the chemical uh, ingredient, uh, provided a slowing down of 
maturation, and that was present in 2014 as well, uh, which was a different year in terms of climate because it was very rainy. Here we have an effect of slowing down uh, the sugar element. This is sort of obvious, though, and expected, but this is not. You see what happened here in 2013. We made a regression between the anthocyanin concentration and the total soluble solids. You see here uh, the linear uh, uh, development that one would expect, but please consider these two uh, interception points uh, in terms of total soluble solids uh, and on the X uh, uh, axis. In the untreated group, what you find is that anthocyanins start accumulating when you have 10 Briggs degrees, while in the treated group, the accumulation of color starts at, at 8.2 Briggs, so that is at a lower sugar content, which means that this treatment is capable of selectively and positively acting on sugar accumulation and on color color accumulation, which is something which is not easily achieved because obviously the two elements go hand in hand. Then there is another element that was very important, I think, and that derived again from Innovine because we had a sort of extreme comparison between, on the one hand, a situation of short sinks, that is, uh, the quantity of leaves uh, per weight being optimal. Consider one uh, bud, uh, 12, uh, one shoot, uh, 12 leaves, uh, one cluster only. And we know that there the quantity of leaves uh, per weight unit is optimum, is not a limit. And this is a, a treatment that nobody would like to have in the vineyard. Wherever you have only three leaves uh, per bud, which is something that I wouldn't wish my worst enemy, even though this happens sometimes as well. What uh, resulted here, based on mathematical modeling, was the following. Not surprisingly, the uh, treatment where only three leaves were available for bunches uh, provided this. Uh, while in the case of 12 leaves, you had uh, a, an acceptable ripening of the cluster. And here we have our systems for gas exchange, uh, which uh, gives us an integrated uh, piece of data on uh, the full canopy. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to gain this piece of information from point-like data. What is interesting, though, is here, because in this graph, you see a proportion of a photo, a phyto uh, synthesized carbon for berry uh, sugar and days after flowering. Uh, what you see th is that in the three leaves uh, system, basically everything is invested in sugar and very little is invested in color, which means that whenever we have a shortage of leaf surface vis-a-vis -vis production, the problem arises that the vine tends to compensate for that and use what it has to accumulate sugar to the detriment of color. Hence the usefulness of knowing that we have to do whatever possible to get to the critical moment, which is the resin with the source sink balance, which is optimum and uh, not a limitation, otherwise we will have uh, uh, additional problems uh, afterwards. I still have 11 minutes or so at my disposal, and I will devote them to the last part of my contribution. I will talk about uh, the response of vineyards to water stress. Here you have Sangiovese and Montepulciano. Uh, same vineyard, uh, same stress level. Consider uh, the Sangiovese variety, see how poorly it does, and see. You, then you look at the uh, right hand side, and your eyes tell you that the Montepulciano variety is doing very well. But actually, the physiology it, it gives a different picture because the Sangiovese uh, case would. Uh, 
seem to be getting rid of all the leaves in an attempt to uh, uh, save on water. If you consider the photosynthesis of the apical leaves, though, you see that photosynthesis is still good, which means that this vineyard uh, will get to a correct uh, level of ripening. But Montepulciano has a different situation. It looks beautiful, but because the uh, stoma are immediately closed, that saves on water, but uh, ripening suffers from, 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 from that due to the lack of photosynthesis, which means that we really have to work a lot on the physiological response of vineyards uh, to water stress or to stress in general. So we shouldn't simply stick to what we see. We should uh, go uh, more into depth of the issue. Now, let me share with you a number of results of tests that we are making. This is a pre uh, water stress test on Sangiovese. Uh, the water content uh, or quantity is reduced uh, progressively, 70, 50, 30 percent, before rehydrating. Uh, see what happens here. The piece of data that you should look at is especially this one, because this is what gives you uh, the efficiency in water usage. That is the ratio between transpiration and photosynthesis. We would like that uh, to be at its maximum level always. What you have to see clearly is uh, that if you uh, provide at least 70% of evapotranspiration, the efficiency in water usage does not change. If you reduce uh, the uh, quantity of water, which is reintegrated, and you reduce it down to 50%, then efficiency, efficiency worsens. In terms of application, what happens is that in a pre uh, uh stress, this vineyard uh, will necessarily need uh, 70% uh, of uh, reintegration of water. We are working very much on that because in several vineyards in Italy we do lack information. I will skip a number of slides because I would really like to come to the final part of my contribution. But I like this picture so much. I like this slide because it introduces wonderfully the, uh, the aspect of uh, bringing new technology into tradition. You see uh, the situation, there is a drone and there is chicken. So. Uh, of course, uh, we can have both, and this serves, as I said, as an introduction to the last part of my contribution, which is devoted to technology. Of course, this is something which is of major interest for all of us, and we um, have heard a lot about uh, precision uh, viticulture and uh, vigor maps. In the afternoon, there will be a specific contribution on this uh, from our department. I will simply anticipate here a number of slides in order to enhance one aspect which I think is very important. This is one of the maps I was talking about. You must have got used to them. And it is a 1.2 hectare uh, Barbera uh, vineyard. We do our map and we have uh, the three classes, high, medium, low. In addition to the map, based on the map itself, we um, characterized uh, uh, things very precisely, agronomically speaking, because I have these three levels of vigor. And if you consider one parameter, which is universally used, uh, is uh, the weight of the pruning uh, uh, wood. And you see that the low vigor uh, uh, entails 485 uh, grams vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, 895 grams in the case of a high vitality, high vigor. And this indeed uh, suggests that actually when we talk about a low vigor based on the map, it is a low vigor and uh, the same goes for high vigor. And yet, productively and qualitatively speaking, what does that correspond with? What does that vigor uh, correspond with? That is what is interesting for us, because in the case of a, a high and medium vigor, uh, the production is still high, while in the case of low vigor, production is much lower. Consider also the density, the compactness of the cluster, uh, which is interesting, because it, it 
is also progressively uh, 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 reducing. Consider BRICS, uh, um, 22, 11.3 in acidity, titrable acidity, this is Barbera, and probably this could be problematic. Certainly there, the vine grower did not know that in his vineyard, he also had a medium and low vigor, which gives these bricks and this acidity, in addition also to a much lower potassium content, which would make it possible to make a totally different wine. So. I would like to state uh, the following. I would like, really, to see maps that really provide information about vigor, but in relation to what is seen in the field in terms of quality and production performances and yield. This is a very interesting piece of uh, uh, information, of course, and in terms of the low vigor, morphology of cluster, and a lower incidence of uh, botrytis, uh, which is what you see on this slide, which means that we should not simply rest satisfied with saying that if you have a medium a vigor that is nice and it is the best situation in mediostat virtus, in this case, the low vigor provides this virtuous, uh, virtuous element. Now, let me conclude with this slide, which is very crowded, I know. But you see, if we want to talk about climate change, about uh, forecasts, uh, about adaptation of vines to that, then we must get convinced of the fact that models are useful. Without models, we cannot make it. This is a complex model. This was recently published uh, within the framework of the MODEM Pro IVM project that I will show you in the last two, three minutes I have at my disposal. Leaving aside the complexity of this slide, consider that the model is simple out of two reasons. First, inputs are uh, climate inputs in 90% of cases, and there is something about the geometry of the vineyard. <clears throat> but then uh, outputs are very interesting. You see the leaf surface and also uh, the fresh weight uh, of clusters, uh, the hanging production, so to say. This is a dynamic model. It is capable of predicting uh, the evolution and development of leaf surface uh, during the season and also the fresh weight of the clusters, which means that this gives us a seasonal um, trend of, the, of what happens in terms of source sinks uh, that we identified earlier on, which is what in the past perhaps we neglected a bit, in that we always uh, um, talked and recent in terms uh, of uh, surface and uh, of leaves and weight of clusters, but at harvest. But that is the end point. What happened before? That is the question. What does it mean to have these graphs at our disposal? Well, we have a seasonal trend, and these are f two different training systems, four different uh, uh, theses. So you have a trend uh, a graph here, which tells you, tells you that, for instance, at the resin, you have an X surface of leaves. So what is it? 1.5 meters per kilo. Is it 0.5? What is it? Two? Uh, well, if you know that piece of data, you can go for a diagnosis, and you can, by means of decision support systems, you have the possibility, I was saying, of having alerts. Uh, of course, you can also look at the vines simply, but if I have also this instrument, I feel uh, on the safe side in a way, because numerically speaking, I can see whether I'm in this condition whereby I have a lack of leaf surface, so if I thin uh, out, I go back to this situation, or I could be there already, and if I, I do the thinning, then I gain much less. Probably I will lose something. Now, before concluding, let me add uh, something about decision support systems, which uh, are extremely useful in uh, terms of making decisions in when it comes to irrigation. There are water balance systems that uh, give alerts 
this is one case. It was uh, made uh, within uh, the framework of the Moda IDM uh, um, project, uh, and uh, Spinofort uh, gives this as a service now. We cooperate with them. You see that the grower can be alerted in terms of possible uh, water uh, uh, alarms. Uh, this is the first alert at 40 percent available water, then there are additional alerts. And this, of course, is helpful in understanding where he or she stands. What I want to say is that uh, decision support uh, systems, uh, and please give me an additional two minutes because I would like to bring this to a close, to draw this to a close. These models uh, are very useful especially when, due to uh, climate change, a, uh, an estate that has never been irrigating has to irrigate. The crucial uh, choice to be made uh, here is not the quantity or the moment of irrigation, but uh, the uh, fact that you have or do not have to irrigate. That is the decision, first of all. Now I would like to thank you for your attention, and I would also like to tell you uh, when closing that we recently published uh, uh, a book uh, um, edited by myself, uh, Pagliotti, and uh, Silvestroni. Uh, the title is uh, La Nuova Viticoltura, New Viticulture. And you will find a, a summary of what I offered you in contribution. Thank you very much.